Hi, uh, thanks to those of you who came. I'm Kathleen Volkmiller, as you know, director of the graduate program in publishing, the Drexel Publishing Group, and co-editor of the Painted by Quarterly Literary Magazine, and this is what we're mostly going to be talking about today. Um, I so wish that we were chatting or Skyping so that I could see you too, but I'm going to pretend that I can, and um, I just want to tell you a few things. There's other people in the room, so if you see me gesturing about and looking different ways, that's why. Um, so there's people here making this happen. And um, also just a reminder that if you have questions, uh, feel free to fire away even as we go. Um, and I'll answer them all when I'm done with the presentation part of the presentation, uh, which is the Prezi that you can see on your screen. So you can uh, g-chat me at KathleenVM at Gmail, or you can tweet me at Kathy Volkmiller on Twitter. So uh, go ahead and fire away with anything you might have, and we'll answer them at the end. I'm not a pro at Prezi, so forgive me for my stumbles, because I'm sure there will be a few. Um, so I'm going to get that going, I think, I hope. All right, so by talking about um, the Painter by Quarterly, uh, I'm, I'm going to use that as a lens through which to talk about the American Literary Magazine in a general way. Obviously, it's the one I know the most about. I've been with it for more than 20 years. Um, I came when I was in graduate school, so it's kind of amazing to me that now I'm an instructor and running the magazine and letting students uh, work for me. Um, so it's pretty, pretty awesome. Um, literary magazines, there's no other way of saying it other than they are essential to liter literary careers. Uh, the way to get your own work published is to, in larger venues and by bigger presses, is to start in the literary magazine world. If you get a handful of um, anything published in a lit mag, it'll open the door at agencies that otherwise uh, won't happen for you. Um, even if you're writing in a completely different genre, um, any publications will help because you will be pre-vetted, as it were. Um, so uh, keep that in mind when you're uh, thinking about sending out your work and what the value of it is, and I'll get a lot more into the value of it. Uh, PBQ has helped to usher forward the careers of Etheridge Knight, Charles Bukowski, Rita Dove, Charles Simic, Louis McKee, Sonia Sanchez, Nick Flynn, Greg Pardlow, last year's Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, Major Jackson, Matthew, uh, Matthew Dickman. They all went on to win penultimate prizes, and that's only the very, very beginning of the list of people that PBQ has helped. Um, being around for more than 40 years, uh, makes it one of the most established magazines in the country and um, allows us to have a history like that to, re to report. Um, there's plenty of new magazines that are, that are big as well, but um, I'm going to let Dan Nestor, who uh, started, he went to Rutgers University in Camden, and we loved his work and published him, and then he ended up working for us. Uh, we do have a policy, as a lot of literary magazines do, that we don't publish our own. Uh, literary so, magazines, there would be no uh, literature. Um, whoops. <laughs> we had to um, fire him to publish him, as it were. But he's now gone on to um, build a very big name for himself. And I'm going to let him talk. Uh, it's not just the Triple A ball, the semi pro league, it's, it's the real deal. Um, without literary magazines, there would be no wasteland, no, um, no Howl, no James Joyce. No Sherman Alexie, no, no Cornelius Eady, no, no Jack Kerouac. So, you lose a literary magazine, you lose literature. But, luckily, we're not going to lose literary magazines. We're not going to lose them. Is that what's in danger here? <laughs> we're not in danger of losing them. No, and I will, I will, we are not in danger of losing the literary magazine, and I will um, 
talk to you a lot more about that if anything the literary magazine is um, growing like wildfire so um, one question that we get asked all the time is how the Painter by Quarterly got its name. So I'm just going to briefly explain that. Um, back in the 70s when it was first created, um, South Street in Philadelphia was where the artists and, and thinkers and movers and shakers all hung out. And um, an arts collective took over a bridal shop that had closed down and had left a bridal mannequin in their window. Uh, that mannequin was dressed up, made up, ready to go to some hellish wedding in the 60s that she never made it to. Um, but the artist decided to use her and would um, dress her up in different ways and pose her in the window. And they didn't even know what to call themselves. People, people started saying, let's go see what the painted bride is doing today. And the window became like a thing on South Street. So they decided, well, we'll go with the painted bride. So the same people who were that arts collective um, made the literary magazine. So she was the icon and the namesake of the art center that still exists now on Vine Street and the Painted by Quarterly, which still exists um, here. So we come out four times a year and then we make one um, hard copy. So that's considered a hybrid publication. About a decade ago, when we decided to go that route, um, after years of being uh, initially folded and stapled, of seeing the old picture, the old um, magazines, and then had a little tiny spine. Um, with the advent of the internet, we really had no choice but to become um, a hybrid, and now many other magazines go that way. Um, there are 600 active literary magazines in the United States. Active, if one defines active as uh, publishing at least once a year and for more than one year. There are perhaps another 400 to 700 magazines that aren't registered with any of the bodies that watch over um, magazines. And I will be giving you some portals at the end of places that you might um, go to to look at literary magazines and decide where you want to be published. Uh, so CLMP, the Council on Literary Magazine Presses, is one of those. Um, some estimate that there are about 5,000 online-only literary magazines, but it's really hard to get a number on any of this because magazines come and go and people go, hey, let's make a magazine because it's easy. The democracy of the Internet, you know, is wonderful and has made it easy, but um, those magazines often fold because people just lose their energy and excitement. But one that did not fold is the North American Review, um, which has been around. I'm just going to stop this. Uh, has been around since 1815 in America, so it's one of the oldest um, in the country, or the oldest in the country. Um, creative writing programs have had a huge uh, boon. Um, there were no creative writing programs prior to the early 70s. Um, and in 1975, there were 79, but in 2010, there were 852. Uh, so now people think we're closer to a thousand and the reason why I'm giving you those numbers is it's the kind of the good news and the bad news in this whole thing. Interest in literary magazines has never been bigger. There are readings in every major city every night of the week often in competition with one another. You could go to more than you know one literary event a day, right? Certainly. But um, so that's the good news. The bad news there is there's a lot of competition and there's a lot of um, journals to swim through and determine which one is right for you. So that's one of the things that, you know, I'd like to try to help you with today. Um, but the 1970s saw this huge uptick in literary magazines, and those are kind of the ones that we look at today, Painted by Quarterly, Plowshares, Paris Review, American Poetry Review, Tin House, Glimmer Train. Those all happened um, in the 70s and are still... Uh, running in some of the more respected magazines. But the internet has brought on even more, and there are many, many online only magazines as well. Um, so let me advance this another second. Oh, Lena Dunham is there because she was actually went to an MFA program, in her show at least. Um, so the AWP conference is something that you should um, think about. That's the Associated Writing Programs Conference.
That website is as a plethora of information for you, awpwriter.org, A-W-P, uh, writer.org. You can find about conferences, contests, small presses, so many different things um, through their website. And um, they have a huge conference every year that moves um, all around the country in different cities. So last year it was in Minneapolis, and there were about 12,000 people in attendance. Uh, there were 550 events, and there were more than 700 literary magazines and small presses in attendance. So that sounds overwhelming, and it should. <laughs> um, I've been going to them for a while, and when, when I have new people there, they're going, oh, I don't know what to go to. The thing about it is you can't really make a mistake. You just show up, and whatever you attend is, is what you attend, and nobody can do it all. So um, I'm just suggesting that you look into that one if you're ever in the area of wherever it is or want to spend the money and have a vacation out of it. People do have fun there, I'll admit. Um, but we're working hard in the day as well. Um, so this year it's in L.A., Los Angeles. Um, here at Drexel, we do something called the Week of Writing, which this year is um, May 9th through May 13th. And we will have a week-long series of panels on different um, genres of writing and different subjects. We'll have uh, readers from different presses, uh, outside guests from all over. Drexel professors um, take a back seat during the week of writing and are barely just running the panels and um, allowing, having guest writers in from all over. So look into that. Um, you can find the information on that at 5027mac.org. There's nothing up there yet, but I can just tell you to save the date from May 9th through May 13th. Um, so, there are so many opportunities for you if you're willing to get into them. How do you navigate these rough waters when you're ready to start submitting your work? Well, that's the most overwhelming part. But there is a hierarchy, and the work, besides the writing and the revision, is determining where you want your work to be published. Um, the NEA, at least seven, eight years ago, changed their fellowship requirements, as did many other um, big arts organizations like the NEA, National Endowment for the Arts, to start including online publications as um, uh, viable and counting towards towards uh, fellowships. Um, as far, uh, here at Drexel, I was asked to speak to a tenure committee about how they could decide whether or not a publication counted, because when the internet first happened, nobody knew what to do with it, right? But the advice I gave them and I would give you is put the work in, right? You have to spend a little time on the literary magazines and go ahead and go to the about page, which is something we never do, right? You never read the acknowledgments, the, the front matter in your books. Um, when you're on the website, go to the about page, see how long they've been publishing. Check out who they're publishing. And of course, if you're early to this game, you're not going to know names. Even all those names have rattled off right now, you might not know. And that's fine. But click again, right? Copy and paste Steve Allman into your web browser and see what he's done. And decide if you like his work. Um, I strongly recommend to people that they uh, look at magazines whose work they like, that they send their work to work they like. I mean, come on, it's subjective. We know that. I'm going to get into that a little bit more. But if you have a shared aesthetic with the editors, um, that's better than not, right? So um, you want to read, 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 and see which literary magazines you like. And then when you find out if you like a few, check them out. See if they're housed at a university. See who their editors are. Uh, you know, Painter by Quarterly has three editorial staffs in three cities. We're in Philadelphia, New York, and Abu Dhabi. And we have uh, grown-ups uh, and students who cycle in and out. So it's very hard to kind of pinpoint Painted by Quarterly's aesthetic and say, oh, they publish X kind of thing. Um, but that's something we actually strive for. There are other magazines that have a more narrow lens. I'm sorry, I'm going to stop this. And there are um, magazines that do theme, thematic issues. Uh, so you, you can and should look for all of that as your... Uh, deciding where you want to go. Um, 
Another really great portal is poetsandwriters.org, uh, but it's P ampersand W. So you know that symbol that you never knew the word for? P ampersand W dot org has a really great list. Um, I'm going to let Dave Bonanno, who is um, editor-in-chief of American Poetry Review, which is probably the single most prestigious poetry-only magazine um, in the country. I'm going to let him talk to you for a second. <laughs> Oh, shoot. Sorry about that. I forgot to turn the, um... <laughs> so he's actually talking about um, the uh, interplay even among literary magazines and he was talking about um, skimming the cream right off the top of PBQ which he does and we're glad to have him do it so he often looks for new talent in our pages um, and that's fine. There's a lot of uh, um, interplay that way among literary magazines, and, and um, it's something that people celebrate in general. Um, so, when you're looking to submit your own work, you're going to first find out where you want to be published, right? And then you're going to control your simultaneous submissions. And by that I mean do not fire away your submission at every single magazine you've ever heard of. Make a structure and decide for yourself. My top tier is Plowshares, Peanut Bread Quarterly, and Paris Review. And only submit to those three magazines. Wait to see if they reject you before you submit to your second tier. I um, could never regale you with enough stories as there are about people who uh, we accept and then they write us back and say, oh no, I just accepted, I just uh, got accepted by, you know, Joe Blow's magazine and I would have rather been in Painted Bright Quarterly and there's nothing we can do about that. Um, in the literary magazine um, world, publication rights stop um, with uh, uh, whoever publishes you first gets you. <laughs> you don't get published in more than one literary magazine. Um, different work, sure, absolutely, like I was saying about Dave Bonanno and APR, but not the same piece. So if you're going to simultaneously submit, make sure that you know where you're sending to. Um, don't revise after you send. That's kind of annoying, and it makes editors feel like you, uh, you know, were really proud of yourself at 3 a.m., decided you were brilliant when you put that last period on, which we all do, but you have to control yourself and not send immediately. It just looks sloppy when you start um, entering, uh, saying, hey, wait, look at this one instead. Um, there are, every year when I attend AWP, there's always a group of um, radicals who want to make a um, portal for us editors that will allow us to blacklist authors. I'm not saying this happens. It might, but I don't know if it's happening. But your name could be collected in a pool of bad people if you um, decide to simultaneously submit and not keep good records. By keeping good records, I mean know where your work is at all times and as you get rejected by people track it as you get accepted make sure you notify the other people who have your magazine who have your piece that um, they can no longer consider it 
that's keeping good records. That actually makes us respect you. So, and when I say us, I mean collectively, all editors. So, um, make your own on hierarchy, aim high, don't revise uh, uh, after you've sent. Uh, don't get carried away with yourself at 3 in the morning and send to every magazine you can. And don't be sloppy. Sometimes um, we get cover letters that say, Dear Editors of, of Tin Penny. And uh, because they just didn't even realize they were sending the same cover letter to a different magazine. Uh, when you get rejected, and you will, print out those rejection slips. Keep them in a big, thick folder, wallpaper your bathroom. Hang on to them because one day when you are famous, people will love to uh, tell each other stories around the, the dinner table, like the fact that F. Scott Fitzgerald got rejected 97 times before uh, anything was published. Um, Agatha Christie was rejected for five years. Uh, the Tale of, Beach of Peter Rabbit by Beatrix Potter was rejected so many times that she decided to self-publish. She's one of the first self-publishing people the world has ever heard of, and she made 250 copies of The Tale of Peter Rabbit, and that book has now sold 45 million copies. Um, e. e. Cummings' bestseller, The Enormous Room, has a dedication page that says, with no thanks to, and then has the 15 presses that turned him down, E. e. Cummings. So, don't worry. There are Kit Kats and there are Snickers for a reason. You will find your magazine. Um, if you ever get a personal note from editors, um, even if they're rejecting you, but it isn't just the, um, the uh, cliche, the boilerplate template that people use for rejections, and they have any little note, this, we, we love this, but it kind of fell apart at the end, we lost the character's motivation, anything at all, take that to heart. Be really, really thrilled about a personal note, because we all get so many submissions that to stop and write you a note is actually meaningful. It means your work was great. Um, and listen to them. And <laughs> so uh, don't, don't be bummed. But there are a lot of boilerplate rejections, and you will learn how to read them and know when you're not getting a personal note as well. Um, there are many prestigious awards among literary magazines. Um, the Pushcart Prize, the O. Henry Awards. So these are awards that happen. You publish in a literary magazine, and then the literary magazine nominates you for these annual prizes. And then if you win that, honestly, presses knock on your door. For your That is the only time. You know, I yell at people all the time, why aren't you sending out your work? Do you think an editor is going to come and knock on your door? They do when you win a big prize first. So um, try going that way instead of not sending your work out. Um, the Best American Short Stories and Best American Essays um, get a lot of their uh, pieces from literary magazines as well. And same thing. You're pretty much guaranteed that at least agents are going to come to you, if not presses. Uh, I'm going to start this again. Literary magazines also um, serve a purpose in their communities in that they... Um, are the people who kind of see themselves as the community um, builders in their towns and cities or universities, even even on just a campus. Um, where magazines are the curators of contemporary voices, but also the cent centralizing writers. Um, at any given event, if you walked around a room and asked people if they have a, a, an affiliation with any other magazine or group or a writer's group or getting their MFA, chances are really high they will. Um, we, Painted by Quarterly, has two events per month. We do a traditional reading series and then we do um, an interactive writing competition that's very loose. That's, the, that's up there right now. Uh, very loose and fun and it's um, called a slam bam. Thank you, ma'am. But every literary magazine are the people who um, have the events. And you really also, I highly, strongly recommend that you get out there and go to those events and see what other people are doing in the world and shake hands and meet people. It doesn't mean your friends will publish you and your friends shouldn't publish you. Um, but it means you'll just know more about the world right around you. Uh, in Philadelphia, there's a magazine called Apiary that does a lot of really wonderful work, and they only publish people in the region. So what if you don't even know about something that's happening in your town um, that might really be looking at you? Uh, when you go to conferences and things like that, um, I'm not going to say that contracts are signed at the bar 
or the soiree, but uh, friendships are made and relationships are built. Um, so Kathy Graber, the woman that I'm going to have you listen to next, she ran a t-shirt shop on the boardwalk in Wildwood for her almost her entire adult life and did not start writing until she was 40. Well, wait, I just lied. She always wrote. She didn't start sending her work out until she was in her 40s. And um, she's now won, um, her bio's this long, and I guess the most prestigious thing on it is that she won the Guggenheim Fellowship, which is the largest financially, <laughs> if not um, literary as well. So I'll let uh, Kathy um, talk to you about literary magazines and how they helped her career. Sorry. Told you I might stumble. So she was talking about the community that's even built within the pages of a literary magazine, and that's interesting, you know, how the pages and the authors from them um, might interact with one another. I teach uh, with the literary magazines a lot, not just out of Painted by Quarterly. I have my students go out swimming in the world of literary magazines and see what they can bring uh, back to the um, classroom. Uh, the reason why I do that is because I think students need a break from reading um, the old cliche of dead white men. is still very much true, and people have to take special courses to not read dead white men. Um, so I feel that with the literary magazine, um, there are so many choices and so many magazines to read that students will have to find their niche, and nobody wants to read something they don't want to read, they say about and the rape, I don't want to make that. I love them, but they so, I feel like that's one of my ways of paying back to the community of what literary magazines have done for me as well, um, in, the, in the hopes that students will support them financially by buying magazines, following authors, all of those wonderful, wonderful things. Um, so uh, the two at the end, this guy says magazines have broken his heart, and this woman, uh, this I, I do have to replay this because this was her face when she opened our magazine and saw her palm in it. <laughs> so, um, and the thing about her too is that she's a much published uh, poet and an award winner and yet she was still that thrilled to see herself again. Seeing yourself on the pages is always nice. Um, so, I use literary magazines in the classroom and students uh, work for uh, the Drexel Publishing Group here. Um, which houses the 33rd, which is an academic anthology, and print only, 5027mac.org, which is an online magazine, um, and online only, it's a news and culture blog, and then the 30, the Painter by Quarterly was our most, um, our arm with the biggest outreach and the most public and uh, widely known. So when you come here for either an undergrad or uh, the graduate degree in publishing, you can work for um, any or all three of those publications that we have here at Drexel. 
Um, I want to see if there are any questions. Didn't we get any? Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to uh, open open that, give you guys a couple seconds. Um, and while, while you're thinking about questions you might have to ask me, I'll just tell you about the graduate program in publishing. Um, I'm really, really excited about it. This is our first big year. Last year we had a soft launch. And um, there are only seven graduate degrees in publishing in the country. And um, um, Drexel is now one of them. I think ours is the best <laughs> for obvious reasons. But one of the really logical reasons why I do is because um, all of our courses are taught by people in industry. We have no one who is an academic teaching for us. We have people from Oxford University Press, Philly Weekly, Philadelphia Magazine, um, HarperCollins, uh, all over and every genre and every rhetorical mode. The other thing that's pretty cool about our publishing program is that um, it's interdisciplinary and it's the only one I've seen that's that as well. You have to take a law class so that you understand something about intellectual property. You have to take a business class from LeBeau so that you understand um, grassroots marketing or the basis of marketing. Uh, you have to take a design class. One design class is not going to make you a designer, but it's going to make you have a far more intelligent conversation with designers when you're working on a publication. So um, I'm a very pragmatic person, and I think the program is as well. You take 10 required courses, and then you get to really make the program be what you want it to be. If you want to specialize in medical editing, you can take courses that relate to that. Um, there's also a lot of independent studies and independent projects happening. Um, so you tailor it to yourself. So I kind of describe it that the required courses are kind of a buffet of the publishing industry. There's really only nine that you're not creating yourself. Nine courses that you must take give you a buffet and then if you then you kind of find your niche and decide what you want to do and focus more on that. So um, if you go to uh, uh, Drexel Graduate pu gra Publishing, wait, I'm sorry. Um, Drexel Publishing Masters is our URL, or email me, or if you just go to Drexel and actually put in the word publishing, you'll find out anything you want, and I'm more than happy to answer any of your questions um, about that program. Um, somebody's asking if acad academic journals seem to have the same aesthetic, maybe a reason for so many online journals. I'm not sure. Academic journals are a different thing, but maybe, um, maybe Amy, you mean literary magazines um, have the same aesthetic. I think that everybody who starts an online magazine has a passion and a clear vision and a feeling that they're serving an audience that is not yet served or um, serving authors that are not yet uh, allowed to be heard. Whether or not that is true is another question because there are so many. My, my fear with the fact that there are probably 5,000 magazines at any given time is that um, are we not watering down uh, the cocktail? You know, are we not, if, ev if everybody's making a magazine, if everybody's standing on a soapbox and talking at the same time, who's being heard, right? I have a little bit of that pullback from it. Um, I, I respect people that are feeling like um, they can't find a venue for their voice, but I feel like there are so many venues that you have to just look, look harder. I think the reason why there are so many online magazines is not because um, they're not, the audiences are being served, but because people want to make magazines, because people have a passion and they'd rather be... Um, uh, editors and in control and that's great I mean I really lucked into um, being in graduate school and scattering scattering you know looking about for some place to uh, read and work um, many of our students who uh, work for us end up staying around as long as they stay in Philadelphia and even past that 
uh, which shows you that the, the work of running a literary magazine isn't work if you love what you're doing. So that might be another reason why there's so many online magazines. Um, Lawrence is asking if literary magazines offer remuneration for, of any sort for published work. That is a great question. Some do, some don't. Um, just like I said about looking and seeing if people um, accept simultaneous submissions, just look right on the guidelines and it will tell you whether or not they pay. Um, I'm going to use that, Lawrence, as an opportunity to talk about contests, which is a, a question I get asked a lot. Very frequently you will see contests that have an entry fee, $10 and even $20 entry fees. And I'm afraid I'm going to tell you the same thing. you got to stop a minute, see who else they've published. Look and see if they're having a prestigious author be the judge. Contests are valuable, and they can change your career. And um, I know many people who won a contest from a good magazine by an illustrious author and also had an agent knock on their door. So I would never say walk away from all contests, but I would say there are places out there who are scams. So you've got to just, again, click, click, click about and do a little more research. Literary magazines, by their very nature, are, always, are almost always nonprofits, almost always volunteer run, um, but you will find some that pay. Um, so Paint and Break Quarterly has just started for the first time in 43 years, and we are not paying very much. And I'm not going to tell you how much we pay. You have to look at our guidelines and find out. But, um, yeah, you're not, you're, there are magazines who pay. And we have another question. Joel is asking on any advice with familiarizing yourself with a lot of at magazines without spending a lot of cash for sample issues. He says, I'm willing to do the legwork, but many pubs seem to make little sample work available. Oh, Joel, I think that the very best portal is one I mentioned earlier, which is p ampersandw.org. Uh, the reason why I like that one the very most is because it has almost, it has so many listed on it. But um, not only will you get a thumbnail of the cover that might give you a little bit of sense of the aesthetic of the magazine, but then there's a blurb about, about it next to it. I think it actually tells you if it pays or not, so that would help Lawrence out. But um, it'll tell you which genres they accept, uh, if they're looking for themed issues, if they don't read during certain months, all of that. So that's a very wonderful catch-all website. Um, there's a place called Zoetrope that is also a wonderful portal. Um, the organization that I mentioned earlier, Council of Literary Magazines and Presses, that is clmp.org. They have a really great um, uh, jump station for literary magazines as well. Um, I, I, I would love it if you wrote me back again because I'm not sure what magazines you're looking at that don't give samples. Uh, when I spoke earlier about Painted by Quarterly deciding to become a hybrid, um, the reason why we really had to do that is because so many magazines were offering so much content for free online that uh, we, everybody in the beginning of the internet, I don't know how old you are obviously, but at the beginning of the internet people thought it was going to be a great marketing tool and everyone was putting up only samples and saying things like, like this, buy us here. And it just didn't work. And it might have worked for a lot of other industries, but it didn't work in the Larry Magazine world, and we all started having to offer our content for free. There are some, I know, that restrict content, but you should be able to read a lot. I don't think you should have to spend money either. I think you should sit at home and go online, because even magazines who still make print issues always have at least some of their work online. So um, creative nonfiction is one that is a very well respected uh, in that genre. It's probably the biggest one for creative nonfiction. And I know that they don't publish everything online and ask you to buy the book, um, but they do publish some. American Poetry Review, I think, publishes everything. So in every genre, I think you should find some. Um, there's another online portal that that's um, good that's called Web Del Soul. It's funky and a chaotic page, but um, if you spend the time and look around, they do put out blurbs from the magazine first or like co a little commentary. It's not just um, a dry list. 
So that's another place that you might look. Um, also, if you have any, I don't know what your genres are, but no matter what you are, if you're interested in poetry or creative nonfiction or fiction, um, I suggest that you look at your favorite authors and see where all they're publishing and then look at those magazines. That's always another way to do it. It's like backwards, uh, like back checking on your favorite authors. Where they publish might be a place for you to publish. So I would look into that as well. Any other questions? Um, email me if you have any that you think of later. Um, this uh, video will exist on YouTube and you can share it with others if, if um, you want or replay parts if you'd like and um, email me if any thoughts cross your mind that you um, wish you had asked. Thanks for coming.